Well, greetings from Paul Dew to everyone involved in the Hall Street uh, works and uh, hope you have all success in uh, getting the, the uh, preservation of this historic site. Uh, we're very, very lucky here at Paul Dew uh, because of the uh, centenary in uh, the 12th of December 2001. Uh, we succeeded in with the National Trust and the Marconi Company um, <clears throat> in getting a purpose-built visitor center here and uh, we've been extremely lucky and I wish you all the best. Uh, Robin Ridge, uh, member of the Paul Dew uh, Radio Amateur Club here yeah, at yeah. Paul Dew. Jim, what's the most important display item you have here? Is there one thing that sums up I, this for, site? For me, I like the original artifacts. I like how we've got the foundations of the, um, the transmitter hall and that outside we've got the Marconi monument. Um, here we've got the original telegraph um, key that uh, Marconi didn't, um, he could receive radio signals um, from ships, but he wasn't licensed to send radio signals inshore because the General Post Office had the uh, monopoly for that. This uh, Morse key was um, for the inland telegraphy and it was one of the original artifacts on the site. Uh, li uh, Marconi operated under a license to transmit and send messages. He didn't own a license for send messages inland. That the GPO had the license for sending messages inland via the inland telegraph. And so um, when he received messages from the ship and he wanted to send inland to London or Falmouth or wherever they wanted to go, he had to have a general post office employee here um, to send those messages via the inland telegraph and that's what this key is all about. So that would have been used what years here? Uh, this is um, from 1900 onward really, 1901 onward. How do you know the provenance of it? Uh, because of the, when it was presented back, we've got actually... Um, yeah, it's a, this most keen sound was presented to us by Miss E. Roberts, whose father Frank worked at Poldry in the early years of the last century. Uh, the key is a post office type, as used for sending telegrams, Frank, a local man working for the GPO as a telegraphist, and our guess is that he worked the GPO landlines that connected Hold You to the de telegraph network. So, um, could you read it all? Yeah. Um, Inland telegraphy was a GPO monopoly, so Marconi employees would not be allowed to operate it. While at Hold You, Frank was given the key and sounder. He mounted the key and sounder on the board with a battery underneath and used it to teach the boys' brigade in Scouts Morse code. Frank left Paul due to join the uh, Royal Engineers just before the outbreak of World War I. By then he was 50 years old, so too old for active service, but was probably employed to teach Morse code to recruits. Francis Richard Roberts with his daughter on holiday at Dartmouth in 1936. So he kept it as a wonderful souvenir. Yeah, that, that was common actually, because their, their whole job was operating all the time. So they, they had an, uh, an affection for their key. Could um, you tap out, thank you, Frank? Uh, I can't because my nose is diabolical. Oh, really? so uh, of all the people in the club, we've got a lot of people in this club that are very, very good on nose. Yes, but yes. It's not me, I'm afraid. So that's got a very distinctive sound, which is quite different from a, a Morse key on the radio. Um, I'm just going to work. This is more what you'd hear today. Uh, you're operating Morse over the radio. Hearing that clear tone, they heard, heard something uh, a, a much more raspy. Yeah, raspy. Yeah. Well, in the early days, yeah. the latest Spark transmitters, they gave it a pretty good musical tone. Our representation of Marconi's Spark transmitter. And we've used a gas lighter, but a spark transmitter, the important bit is the spark gap. And all you do is you put your aerial across the spark gap, as easy as that. All Marconi could do is transmit a spark or not, and of course that's all I can do with this as well. So that's a transmitter. The receiver is uh, called a coherer. It's uh, a little glass tube uh, with a metal electrode on each side and metal filings on the inside. And you connect your aerial to one side, earth to the other, and what happens if um, you pick up on your area or signal it's strong enough, it makes the farming stick together. Um, and that, in this case, acts like a switch as a battery under here, and it acts like a switch and passes current through the meter. 
So if I transmit, you see the needle goes across. Um, do it again. When I stop transmitting, I'll do it again. When I stop transmitting, the needle keeps flowing because the bunnings are still stuck together. So to reset it, you have to tap it. And tap. Ah, so he adapted the coherer with this clicker that clicked onto the filings and separated them. Uh, he, what, what he actually did is he, instead of having the current go through a meter, he went through a little relay and he had something that looked like a doorbell, probably was a doorbell, and the thing reset itself. Quite clever, really. Um, Marconi didn't invent the coherer. It's um, accredited to Francois Brandley and Oliver Lodge. But what he did do is he bind it. He kept on tinkering and tinkering, tinkering, making it more and more sensitive. So he used silver electrodes and he had like a, a, a particular wedge safe on his electrodes and he used um, silver filings. They reckon he filed a coin, but he used to say a blunt file made the best filings for a coherer. And he also, um, because the filings would oxidize with time and then the coherer got less sensitive, so what he did is he used a mercury um, vacuum pump to evacuate the tube until his very good fortune and the mercury vapour made his coherer even more sensitive. So he kept on tweaking the technology to get the most out of it he could. And of course, whereas this is good for about a foot, Marconi went across the Atlantic. But he did have 20 kilowatt at his disposal. <laughs> But it's, it's nice to show this because it's a practical example of um, what he did as opposed to all the theory and the boards. Well, we're at Poldew, uh, the Marconi Centre in Poldew in Cornwall, and uh, the site of Marconi's first transmission across the Atlantic in 1901. Um, what we're actually looking at uh, here is uh, a, a later aerial, well after experiments in the, uh, the, the Atlantic experiment. This was an experiment done in the 1920s and they had this round, uh, what you can see is a, a raised round embankment uh, that had a railway track on it that had a big uh, aerial array that uh, went round on the track that was a directional aerial for the shortwave band. Um, the transmitters of the day tended to be long wave which was very long aerials and uh, needed a lot of power. Um, but they were increasingly beginning to find out that the shore wave bands were actually very usable with more reliable lower powers to get larger distances and these directional aerials. Um, interestingly, one of the problems they've had here is over this side you've got the transmitter block which had the generator and the transmitter um, and before um, the early trans um, the early uh, aerial arrays for Marconi used to be around this block and the aerial used to go down on top of the building and be connected to the top of the transmitter but this round aerial um, you needed to get the radio energy from the transmitter to the center of that aerial now you where needed... was the railway track uh, actually on the round There's... bankment here because it's a very big array big wire aerial very what large. sort of train track was it? I mean, it wasn't I, I'm a not general sure. railway track. I suspect it was. Really? I suspect it was uh, a regular track. The whole thing had to pivot around the middle, and it was a very big structure. So you had to get your radio signal from the transmitter block to the centre of this aerial. Show me, where would the aerial have been? The well, original? the aerial, the whole aerial, we've got some pictures of it inside. It's a, it's a, a, it looks like a big bedstead, really that encompasses this whole thing and it used to rotate about the middle. Presumably it was it, that it was there, was it? No, the whole thing. The whole yeah, width what from was the edge central, to... The central point? Oh, this was the centre point. Right, so where we're, where we're looking at now is pivotal in, yes. in the transmission here. Tell yeah. me why. Why was this in the centre? Why did we have a railway track round the outside? Because you want, you're not going to put your aerial up because um, it's directional. It's only going to point one way. But you, when you build your aerial, you're not going to rebuild it every time you want to point a different way. So you want the whole structure to turn so that you can point it uh, so that the radio signal goes in the direction you want it to go. 
Um, but your promised direction would did they want it to go? Uh, this this site I think was basically America, but uh, because it was so directional, uh, whether you were going South America, North America, you you would change it. But of course they could they could turn it around and point it any way they wanted. Um, the the facility was a test facility. It's experimenting on what works and what. What years are we talking about? This is the 1920s. So um, how long did this last for? Uh, until the early 1930s, when they closed the site. Um, so you can see this trough here, and this took the, the feed for the aerial to the transmitter block. Now, they had a problem because how do you get the radio signal from there to here? And what they used was a big pipe and put a wire down the middle, and that effectively was the first coaxial cable. Really? Yeah. So the pipe, what do you mean by a pipe? A metal, metal pipe. A metal pipe. I'm not sure if it was copper or not, but it was a metal pipe and it had a copper wire went right down the That's middle. That's a coaxial cable. That's a coaxial That's cable. That's what we've got on uh, every roof in the country yeah. going up or, to an aerial. Televisions and a television, everywhere. Yes. Yeah. And it all started here yeah. because of the need of, yeah. as to how to... Yeah. So what are these called? What are these? Uh, what year did these go up? Well, these the masks. Ones? Well, th these masks are for our radio amateur club. Oh these, right. These are. I mean, they're not copies of anything that was there no, previously. No, they're lighting towers actually. Um, but uh, I mean, it's interesting because Marconi always said that he was the original radio amateur. Um, he always, always considered himself an amateur. He wasn't. He wasn't a scientist. He wasn't a mathematician, a physicist, anything like that. He was an entrepreneur. Took the technology of the day and refined and refined and refined. And when he did understand things, he bought in the help. He got John Ambrose Fleming and Franklin and Kemp and got some amazing people, some amazingly clever people working for him, that uh, helped him uh, meet his. Uh, his ambitions in radio. In fact, those people working for him were uh, are named uh, in their own right. Have got um, various technologies yes. they've been involved in, and that uh, amazing, amazingly clever people in their own right. So we're, we're standing on sort of a holy ground here. Yeah. What What would this have uh, helped uh, uh, further Marconi's ambitions? How well, did this do it? Well, the, this this was uh, the the. Um, directional aerials. The early work in directional aerials are actually was just prior to the First World War and they set up an array of directional aerials along the south coast. This was Franklin and uh, and they would um, they were listening to the German fleet and when the German fleet put to sea at the beginning of the First World War uh, this site um, or and these aerials triangulated uh, and detected that the fleet had moved, they told the Admiralty, and that resulted in the Battle of Jutland. Yeah. Which was just being celebrated, the anniversary. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I mean, it played a pivotal part in yeah. what was might have been a Pyrrhic yeah. victory, as they call it. Well, it, uh, they, say, they say we might not have won the battle as such, but what we did do after that war is the German fleet stayed in port after that. They were frightened to come out. So, um, so from, you uh, did that in the Second World War? Yeah. So, so if you if you can convince uh, convince your enemy that they don't bring their resources to bear, then you effectively you've won the battle, as far as I'm concerned. So was this site here one of the pivotal parts of Jutland? No, this was a bit later. This was um, they found they they gave the shortwave band to radio amateurs, and the radio amateurs were getting better and better results with it, and uh, and the. The, the powers to be thought well actually um, we should be looking at these bands from a commercial use because they're far more useful in fact they turned out to be far more useful than the long wave bands and the radio amateurs successfully use the short wave bands to this day it's a very, they're very interesting bands to use what what do you think is the importance uh, to the nation if not the world of uh, pole view and uh, and and lizard stations why are you keeping them going what's you know are people really still interested in it today with all the mobile phone technology? Yeah, I, I personally think that people seem to are under the impression that the technology has stopped, that we know everything about radio, um, you've got the internet now, um, 
why are you still going? And the fact is, radio amateurs are still expanding um, uh, radio and our knowledge of radio. The technology hasn't stopped. We don't know all about it. It's going faster. We've got software to find radios now. We've got a member of our own um, a club here that's writing software um, for transmitters of software defined radios and that's where instead of having a radio and doing anything in um, radio components you do most of the work in a computer with mathematics um, you've got so the day of the ham is not over oh it's it's just just beginning we've got satellite um, radio amateur satellites being launched you've got whole you've got um, people well, what about the first ham on the moon <laughs> well yeah radio wise well you think um, Marconi um, transmitted uh, to across the Atlantic in 1901 and he barely managed the three dots and you could have been an adult and, uh, and witnessed that and in 1969 you've got Neil Armstrong walking on the moon in two-way communication with video and that same adult who watched Marconi struggle with his first three dots across the Atlantic could have witnessed that as well and that really was Mar what really Marconi brought he we did the technology forward and, uh, and you know he helped us uh, with other things the, the, the people who work for Marconi um, they I mean, the radio valve became um, the more complicated valves for radar during the Second World War. There was people working for Marconi here that got interested in hydrophones and sonar, which became a central uh, technology in the First and Second World War. These, the, everything had implications and uh, I find that uh, tremendously interesting.